Begin. Okay, pardon my back. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here tonight. Hi, guys. Hi. Um, we're going to get started here. Pardon my back for just a moment, and then I'm going to go do, work the camera. Um, I want to welcome you to tonight. Uh, I'm going to tell you a bit, little bit about Friends of Mary Meeting Bay, and then I'm going to introduce you to these folks, and Ed will further that along. Um, this is our 41st year as Friends of Mary Meeting Bay, and we've done just incredible work over the last several decades, and we're very proud of that, and I'm just going to give you just a little taste of what that looks like. And this is our 19th or 20th speaker series, so it's been going on for quite some time. I think we kind of started it here in this area. So um, we're also pleased with that. We've had a really good year this year. Last year was also great. We just seem to keep putting together some really good programs here, and we're very pleased with it. Um, Friends of Mary Meeting Bay does, has several uh, areas of focus. Research and advocacy, uh, uh, stewardship and conservation, uh, and education are the, the primary things that we work on. So research and advocacy, we've done a lot of things over the years. We've done a current study in the Bay and sediment study in the Bay and a toxin study with mussels also in Mary Meeting Bay, all of which have been a really good baseline for the other work we've done for the advocacy that we've worked on. We've also, since we're keying on that tonight, done a lot on fish pass and we continue to do so um, in being very helpful with opening up the St. Croix along with others uh, to alewives, back to alewives after many years of the, it being shut down and working on alewife passage all over the state as well as uh, anadromous fish passage and catadromous fish passage around the state as well. So that's something we're very proud of and continue to work on along with water quality. We've uh, helped upgrade the Kennebec River and we're working on upgrading the Androscoggin River, the red-headed stepchild in Maine and actually in the nation. Uh, we continue to work on that in spite of um, incredible opposition uh, at the legislature, but we will continue to do so year after year. And anyone who's interested in doing water quality monitoring with us, please come on up and talk to me or to Ed, and uh, we'll get you hooked into maybe doing some sites along the Androscoggin River, which we'd really love to upgrade because we're there already. It's been upgraded. We just have to get the legislature to follow along. So, um, and then uh, in, in conservation and stewardship, we've done some great work around the Bay. We just, in the last uh, two years, uh, uh, preserved uh, the, 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 the best archaeological sites, so they say, in the state of Maine, in Dresden. Uh, and we are, uh, continue to work on easements all up and down the Bay, all through all of the towns that we work on through the Bay. So we will continue to do that. And if you hear of land that needs to be protected, please come to us and talk to us about it. And education, which is kind of what I spend a lot of my time on. Uh, we work with uh, kids that used to just be fourth grade. We now do preschool, which is really fun, up through seventh grade, which is an entirely different dynamic. Uh, and uh, we reach about two th almost 2,000 kids per year in our school outreach to all of the schools around the Bay and talk to them about um, the ecology around the Bay, but also some of the things that we'll be talking about here, about fish passage and some of the research that we do and how they can help. And the teachers have been really great in being involved with that. So it's really been incredible. And then we do a Bay Day twice a year where we get fourth and fifth graders out onto the Bay, away from the fluorescent lights, away from their devices, away from their desks, and into the mud and, and beach saning and and uh, uh, fish printing and wigwam building and they're out in the mud and in the grass and outside and working and they love it and we love it. And we do about 450 kids a year with that and we try to expand that a little bit every year. So again, we have a lot of volunteers, almost 20% of our, uh, of, our, of our membership are volunteers, which is a phenomenal number. Um, and uh, so we would love it, if, again, if you are not working with us, we'd love it if you can. So. Um, so uh, that, those are the things that we do uh, year to year. We also do the speaker series, which costs about $1,000 a year to put on. Patagonia has been really wonderful in sponsoring that with us. And they donate a piece of, of um, clothing to us uh, for each month that we do this. Uh, and then we ask if you will um, donate to that. And so this is the one for this month. You can actually get a smaller size if you're not at, <laughs> this is like, this will be a dress on me. So, um, so if you're smaller than that, that would be great. But if you just put your name on a piece of paper that's in this, 
container and then you put it in this container and then um, if you would put at least in, at least five dollars in that would be really great uh, put but put in what you can afford we also do take checks ch take checks so if you want to give us a thousand dollars we will accept it that would be perfectly fine um, and you can also put that right in the basket so the money will go in the basket and I've told you the other things that will be intuitively obvious when it gets to passed around so and we also have a sheet where you could sign up please it just tells us mostly um, uh, what people have the most interest in so from year to year we can continue to give the folks in the community what they would like to hear and see most so I'm gonna yes so just snag the pen from that clipboard the extra pen in the okay all right uh, well actually he just gave it back to me <laughs> so there is the pen um, and so I will I'll start this Libby with you can you hear okay so also I'm going to remind you guys just to tell you that um, so that everyone can hear if we can talk up like Ethel Mormon would say talk to the back of the room so if you can do that so everyone can hear that would be great because we don't have a microphone right now um, and I think that will do it for now and I'm going to turn this over to Ed yeah we could and I will give this back. Thank you. And let me, well, uh, let me echo Kathleen's welcome. I really appreciate everybody coming here. I'm Ed Friedman. I've been chairing Friends of Marimini Bay for a long time. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure to have Nate and Doug here tonight with us. Uh, as many of you know, we've worked on fish passage issues for a long time. Um, and so this is a, you know, and we've had other talks about fish, but this is the first time in this sort of format. So, um, I want to introduce our guests and also say that the plan for the evening is to kind of start from ground zero. Some of you know a lot about fish, some of you may know nothing about the migratory fish, but we, we typically take our um, uh, videos from the speaker series and get them out to community cable TV. So there may be people watching that don't know anything. So, so again, try and start from the bottom and, and build up to some of the major issues. Um, Far into the table, Nate Gray. Uh, Nate is a, is a good friend and he's on our Friends of Mary Meeting Bay board. He's a fisheries biologist for the Department of Marine Resources <coughs> and he's project leader for what they call the Kennebec Hydropower Developers Group, KHDG program through Department of Marine Resources, DMR, uh, in their Sea Run Fisheries uh, Division, Sea Run Fisheries and Habitat Division. Um, He's worked on the Kennebec for many, many years, was around when Edwards Dam came out in Augusta and has seen the populations of river herring uh, grow from maybe 100,000 to, uh, you know, 3 million. Um, he spends a lot of his time in the spring in uh, river herring season up um, manhandling, uh, no exaggeration, the uh, fishway, fish lift up at Benton Falls Dam on the Sebastocook River. and and. This may come out in, in tonight's talk, but as we get into fish passage issues, it really takes a lot of hands-on work to ensure that systems are working properly. And uh, Benton is Nate's home during that part of the season. So uh, he's also worked a lot with the shad restoration in the river and was involved in the Waldoboro shad hatchery when they were operating. Uh, Doug right here on my immediate right, Doug Watts, lives up in Augusta, there's probably nobody that knows more in the state of Maine about the nexus of fish rest, migratory fish restoration and the law. Uh, Doug's background in Maine has been that of a, of a uh, uh, historian, newspaper reporter, and he's an author, he's written a great book uh, called Elwife, right? Yeah. yeah. He, he, I, I actually forgot to suggest that he might want to bring a few to shamelessly sell but he has one with him that he can, uh, there, it is. there it is, yeah. So you can, you can get it through Doug. And uh, uh, he's president of the Friends of the Kennebec, well he was president of the Friends of Kennebec Salmon for years, and now the organization is known as Kennebec Reborn. Uh, Doug and his brother Tim were, uh, wrote the Citizens Envi uh, in uh, yeah. Endangered Species Act petition to list the American eel a long time ago. Um, it, it ultimately was denied, but it had sufficient merit that um, uh, Fish and Wildlife accepted it and, and uh, um, they just decided in the end not to list the eel. And that's primarily because um, in the ESA process they try and uh, limit the listing populations to discrete population segments or distinct population segments, DPSs, 
And whereas most of the fish we're talking about tonight all come back to where they uh, started from in terms of where their eggs were hatched out and laid, uh, eels are the opposite. And so they don't really know that, you know, today's Kennebec eel could have come from an eel from, you know, Louisiana, you know, or uh, Florida last year. So they don't, they didn't have a way to get a handle on listing a distinct population segment like the Kennebec American eel. So anyway, um, so we're going to just start off by, uh, I'm going to ask Nate who the heck we're talking about. I've, I've sort of mentioned the eel, um, but we have a cast of characters of migratory fish, Nate, and, and if you could fill us in on what they are, who they are, and uh, you know, what we call them, you know, anadromous catadromous, right. what those words mean, yeah. and uh, why are they so important? Uh, Vis-a-vis -vis Maine and the Bay. Right. Uh, the, the, we have uh, several species of diadromous fish that call Meriming Bay complex and the rivers that feed into it home. And you guys probably know the better part of them. You know, the, 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 the king of fish, so they say, the Atlantic salmon, um, striped bass. Uh, we have a, a cheat sheet here, just so I don't forget. Uh, these are all fish. Uh, diadromy is, 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 comes from the Greek. It means both ways. Uh, anadromous uh, comes from the Greek, and it means ana, to ascend, to head upstream to spawn. And kata is the exact opposite, to descend, uh, and head downstream to spawn. And catadromy would refer to, we have one catadromous species here, and that's the American eel. Uh, it's also one of the longest lived species we have, at least in the freshwater environment. But all these species are obligate one way or the other to either live in the fresh water like the eel and grow up to be big eels and then head to the ocean to spawn, or grow up in the ocean and head to fresh water to spawn. They, they have to go one way or the other. And uh, their importance, at least in the fish that I principally work with, can't be understated. We always refer to river herring as being a keystone species. And, by today's standard, it's, it seems kitschy, cliche, you know, when we, when we look at river herring as being a keystone species because everybody thinks, ah, keystone, what's that mean? Uh, when you look at it, it becomes the principal ecological driver in the time frame, the biological window that it exists in either one environment or the other, the marine environment or the freshwater environment, or in the case of Merrimeeting Bay complex and the rivers that connect everything in between, that, that space in between. You have, you know, literally millions of small fish running up a river and carrying all those marine nutrients with them to spawn in these freshwater environments, either pond or river. When we refer to river herring, we're not just saying alewife, it collectively uh, describes uh, the alewife and also the blueback herring. Um, and blueback herring spawn principally in the river stems and in the shoal waters of the rivers, and the alewives head up into the still waters uh, in the pond basins to spawn. What we know, at least historically, about the alewife, and by the way, <coughs> Doug's book, alewife is very good. It's basically, it says right on the back, this is a history of, you know, this, this fish, the alewife, uh, from 5000 BC uh, to present. And when we look at the, the extent of the population, what we know historically, uh, at least with alewife from the Carolinas all the way up to the Maine Maritimes, that this fish has been removed from at least 90 plus percent of its historical habitat. And so that starts ringing bells in our heads as, as restoration people, knowing that they're a keystone species because of their prolific nature. They drive the ecosystems above them and below them. Uh, and I'm not going to talk much more on river herring because there's several other species to describe here. We have American shad. We worked extensively on restoring those fish as well. They also come in in the spring to spawn in the main stem rivers. Uh, the largest uh, herring species in the world. We have two species of its sturgeon, both of them either threatened or endangered. Um, the Atlantic sturgeon and the short-nosed sturgeon. We have very significant populations of both in the, in the greater Kennebec Basin and the Merrimigan Bay complex. Um, Tom cod, which nobody really thinks about because they come in and spawn underneath the ice. Uh, smelt, much the same, very small, but very significant in their numbers and, and, and the ecology of the system that they support. 
I think that about covers it really um, uh, as far as a basic overview of the species we're talking about, uh, but it, 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 that's a very basic description. They spawn one way or the other. Right. Yep. Thanks. Um, we have a map over here of the Merrimeeting Bay watershed, which is about 10,000 square miles, and a map behind me of, at one point, all the dams in Maine, hydro and non-hydro. Doug, could you talk to the importance of the bay to these species we're talking about? And you've done a lot in the past with petitions, researching your role as a historian, kind of looking at colonial petitions and so forth of what was here at one point. And, and you know what's here now. Yeah. Well, um, I brought with me tonight this incredible book called Life on the Abigadasset by Albert Dunlap. Um, it is by a gentleman who lived on the Abigadasset um, in the late 18, well, in the, I think he died in the mid, well, he's born in 1902 died in 1978. This gentleman here um, has compiled probably the best eyewitness document, documentation of what it was like to live in Merry Meeting Bay and to be a commercial fisherman, um, wherein commercial fishing for shad and herring and eels was part of the farm economy. These folks all had they had a working farm on the Abigadasset, but they also ran um, weirs in the Abigadasset during the spring runs for shad and herring, um, and they also ran what they called drift nets for American shad. And the time he was going out, he was writing about this, is what he was a teenager, he was doing this with his father. And this was around 1910, 1915, around World War I. This was right before the pollution from the paper mills on the Kennebec wiped out the um, Merry Meeting Bay Shad Run. Um, and it's a incredibly, it's, it's probably the only um, good account of what this was like. What Merry Meeting Bay was like before it was severely polluted. Everything after that was when there was not enough dissolved oxygen for most fish life to survive. And that dissolved oxygen wasn't restored in Merry Meeting Bay, in the river in Augusta and Waterville until about 1980. Um, some of the worst fish kills on the Kennebec occurred right on our bicentennial in 1976, mm -hmm. which is kind of scary when you think about it, is that we're about celebrating our 200th birthday and the Kennebec River was at its deadest point in history. Um, and I would recommend this book to anyone who's interested in the history of of, um, of this area because it's really well done. It was a family manuscript that the family decided to publish after the author d um, died. He wanted to make this thing get published. Um, he kept working on it until he passed away. Um, but um, in, in concert with that, um, I want to, um, I, I just, I just, um, this is a, this, as a historian, this is the kind of stuff that I'm seeking, is that um, let's see, which, oh, here's one. Maine farmers had a special use for the eel skin. This is skinning an eel and just taking the skin. It was so tough that it was used as a flexible hinge on homemade flails that were used in threshing beans and peas. The long handle of the flail was fastened to one end of the heavy 30 inch length of the three inch round horn beam by a dry eel skin. The leathery hinge withstood years of vicious pounding. I can't think of 
a quote that more captures the way people lived on this river for so long because they're using an eel skin to make a tool to thresh their beans and peas. And the stem, the, the stick of the flail is made of a three inch hornbeam sapling that they cut out of the woods probably within a hundred yards of the farm. Everything that they were doing, the peas, the beans, the hornbeam stick, it was all grown right there. And this was the lifestyle, the way of life of the people who lived along Merry Meeting Bay, um, really up until um, the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this, certainly all of the activity on the river stopped when the pollution on the river became so severe that there wasn't any point in putting out weirs anymore. There wasn't any point in setting out drift nets because, in fact, there wasn't any point in going near the water because the water was yeah. filthy. So, well, well, in a, in a, in a very real sense, I think that that pollution is what saved, has protected the bay over all these years. Uh, the two rivers were so, two main rivers were so, so bad. Uh, we have our spring bay day uh, at Chop Point School, right where the bay empties out down the Kennebec. It's about a 200 meter wide slot in the bedrock. When the people that own Chop Point School bought it in the 60s, I believe, they talk about the foam on the river being a good three feet high at the point. So it's really changed a lot, the color and foam act and then and then other changes uh, and the bay is is interesting because it's really it was the only place in the whole Gulf of Maine where all of these species used it for either nursery or and or spawning habitat um, you've touched on a few things uh, Doug especially but both of you uh, talked about the uh, the common fishing in the old days as a matter of course um, we had a speaker here last year I think it was uh, talking about the mortal sea and how we tend to have fished out our resources uh, to the extent of our technology and if you guys could both maybe talk about threats to migratory fish over the years talked about pollution but before that maybe there was fishing I know there was an early sturgeon fishery in the bay and, and, and those were fished out in the late I think the late 1600s maybe um, if you could touch on some of the threats and how those have changed over time that would be great, and then we'll get into some other stuff. Sure. <clears throat> Threats. They are pretty basic, uh, and they rapidly expand out from the basic to the to the far more complex. Uh, Ed touched on one of the principal ones early on, which was essentially, you know, overfishing. Um, and then we uh, added basically hydropower to that, the installation of, of uh, at first, hydromechanical dams, uh, dams meant to harness, you know, the power of the water through gravity, uh, not necessarily to produce electricity, but to, to drive line shafts in a mill um, for multiple textile productions. Uh, and as the, the technology advanced, finally it was shifted over to uh, hydroelectric production. And about the same time that that happened, um, fairly early on, uh, 1909, 1908, uh, uh, that advent of the Industrial Revolution on the eastern seaboard led to the installation of these very large factories uh, and basically uh, the problem of what to do with the waste from these factories uh, was instantly solved because you had this giant wet conveyor belt that just conveyed it to someplace else where it wasn't an immediate problem and they just dumped it into the river. Byproducts from tanneries and byproducts from the paper industry and byproducts from just about every every uh, producer tied to the river systems all well, that's where it went into the river and it still occurs to some degree today although to a lesser extent there are certainly a lot more stringent regulations when it comes to you know, 
the municipal waste discharge and, and uh, you know uh, sewer outfalls, basically you know, treated treatment plants uh, that are that are typically heavily treated um, to kill the bacterial content of it, but you know they. Doesn't doesn't treat everything, you know, so it goes into the river. And those those threats are still all there to some degree. Um, you know, overfishing now is a lot easier because there's fewer fish. You know, uh, lack of passage at at, uh, at dams um, and pollution are still uh, significant threats to these resources as they remain in extant in the basin. Doug. Well, um, I want to put this in perspective for everybody. Um, I'm from Massachusetts. I went up to the University of Maine when I got out of high school in uh, 1982. And um, so I've been in Maine ever since. Um, and I've lived in Augusta since 91. Um, <coughs> right along the river, primarily. And um, everybody I met in Augusta the folks who are from town grew up with the river being polluted to the point where um, nobody would go near it. And if you were from Augusta, you just simply would not go near the river. What you would do is you'd have a camp on the Belgrade Lakes, or you'd have a camp on Moosehead, or you'd have a camp somewhere else, and you'd go to camp because you were going to a clean place, a clean pond. Um, but by 1991, the water quality in the Kennebec was really very good, certainly in Augusta. And since then, it's gotten even better. And even today, and that's 25 years now, the folks who are from Augusta will not go to the Kennebec River. They will, not, they will not recreate on it. They will, certainly won't swim in it. If you say you went swimming in the river, they'll go, <laughs> you must be from Amhai. <laughs> um, and this is what I call the cultural, the cultural hangover of what has happened here, is that you have multiple generations of people who have been taught by their parents and their grandparents don't go near this place because it's unclean. And so ironically, the people who do use the river, my, my wife Lori and I, we go down to, we call it Sturgeon Beach. It's right underneath the Father Curran Bridge in downtown Augusta. There's a little beach there. We go in there in July on a hot day and we walk behind the buildings in downtown and there's a little beach there, it's just a little sand beach at, at low tide. And there's Atlantic sturgeon six feet long, as long as this table jumping right in front of us. And the people in the cars going over the bridge are looking at us like we're kookaburra. Mm -hmm. And they're also asking us, what are those fish? Are those stripers? Mm -hmm. Are they seals? And so every time that we're on the bridge watching sturgeon jump, we end up meeting people and telling them this is these are what sturgeon are and it's been interesting because I can see the new generation kids that were born in 91 now they're 18 my nephew's age and they are starting to explore the river again because it's right in their backyard um, and a lot of what I think Nate and I are doing is trying to keep that door open so that this new generation of kids who were born after the river was cleaned up have someone to tell them this is what you're seeing. I mean, these folks don't know, I mean, a, a, an 18 year old kid doesn't know what an American shad is because they've never seen one before. Because there weren't any in the Kennebec in any number until 15, 20 years ago. Um, so there's this whole re-education and re, 
invitation process that I think is really important, I think FOMB is doing a lot of that, is bringing people back to the shoreline and literally getting them in the water and telling them that it's safe to go in the water. Well, the, when we have our bay days, <clears throat> and Nate typically does some beach sanding with the kids. These are a series of hands-on environmental workshops. And it's, it's pretty uh, in, intoxicating and fun. It's, uh, who doesn't like looking at a bunch of little mummy chugs and, uh, you know, baby eels, and who knows what you'll find when you, when you draw a beach sand. Um, I'm going to just flip these posters up here before we as we go on here, talking about some of the threats, and, and I think most of you know that, you know, things are a lot cleaner, as Doug has said. Overfishing is not quite so much of a problem, but dams are a big issue. Um, in our audience is Steve Brook, who was coordinator of the Kennebec Coalition. That group took out Edwards Dam in 1999, I guess, or 1999. First time a working, working hydro dam had been removed in the United States, and that was really great, and we appreciate that, Steve. But these are, uh, most of the dams in Maine are what we call run of the river dams. Typically the water, just in high water, goes over the top. But there are some that are really big and have big impoundments. Uh, Wyman Dam on the Kennebec and Gulf Island Pond Dam is one. So I'll just flip through these, they're sort of in a sequence. So that's a, you know, big dam. And what we're talking about are these turbines that are in the dams. And they spin at different rates depending on the size and all that, but this is what can happen. These are eels that are stuck in the turbines. And uh, Kathleen, who's, who introduced us earlier and running the camera now, had a, has a good friend. She's a friend of mine as well. Uh, was a former senator in the, in the Maine legislature from down east. And he had a, a constituent who worked at a small hydro dam down east. And every fall, when the, uh, the big eels, the silver eels, tend to migrate out to the Sargasso Sea for their one and only shot at spawning, uh, this gentleman said they would have brownouts as eels clogged up the turbines. This is a picture of what can happen to the eels. This is right up at, at uh, Benton Falls, where Nate works, and uh, which now has a really good... Um, Hopefully we'll talk about that, a screen in front of the turbines that can stop this kind of nonsense. This is at Shawmut Dam on the Kennebec. And this doesn't just happen to eels, but it's easier to find them. You know, they're three feet long. Some of you probably saw photos. We took this um, fall of um, live young that came through the Brunswick Dam. And this is um, a little bit different. This is a, uh, a chart of one day I picked up about 17 uh, cut up eels at uh, below Benton Falls and we sent a bunch of them down to Texas A&M to get tested for toxins and these are PCB levels and these two levels here, the eels are about 23 years old, these two levels are the levels at which the state issues fish consumption advisories based on cancer and non-cancer. It's 11 parts per billion to be protective of cancer, 33 for non-cancer. And you can see what the levels of PCBs were up in the four, five, six hundred range in these eels that we were catching. So instead of these eels getting to successfully out-migrate and spawn, they got chopped up. Birds eat them, otters eat them, minks eat them, raccoons eat them, whatnot. All the contaminants get recirculated within a fairly closed ecosystem in the streams here. So. So not only are they kind of cool, neat creatures and have an incredible life cycle, but if you want to be really crass, they help to turn up, uh, to clean up our rivers a little bit if they were able to get out, which doesn't say what the sargasso is like, but uh, anyway. Um, Doug, a, yes. lot of, a lot of your work with us and on your own with friends of uh, Sebago revolves around the, the laws that we have in place in theory to, well, for all sorts of purposes, I guess. <laughs> Uh, some of them to protect fish, some of them to protect water quality. Um, could you summarize maybe some of the current laws protecting our migratory fish? Talk about the historic BEP decision that went to the Maine Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court uh, over the you know, S.D. Warren case 
and what that meant and uh, and talk about the licensing process for Dems. Well, I can cut this to the quick and say that um, everything that this gentleman is trying to do and I'm trying to do and Ed's trying to do and many other folks um, ultimately requires a working partnership between citizens and their government, that being the legislative and the executive branch. Um, when there is some kind of consonance in there, you can get work done. You can get things accomplished. You can have citizens in groups like FOMB come up with ideas and come up with willing landowners and willing partners and then if funding is needed, get that funding. The Land for Maine's Future is a perfect example of that. It's the Maine people at referendum recommending money to go to purchasing and protecting key piece, pieces of land. Um, when you don't have the executive branch and the legislative branch working in consonant with citizens, the system breaks down. And so you can have citizens um, breaking their backs trying to get things done, but they hit this glass wall wherein the executive branch will not do their part. And that is exactly where we are on the Kennebec River. Um, at Corbisaconti Stream and Gardner, which is a, a very large watershed, it's 200 square miles. Um, we have a small dam there that's about the height of the ceiling where Kathleen is. Um, it was built in 1850. It hasn't done anything since 1900. Um, the only reason we can't get it removed is because the governor's office not only will not support removing it, but is actively opposed to it for philosophical reasons which we cannot perceive. Um, I went to the state superior court about this two years ago, um, asking the state to use its fishway law to require a fishway there, and the attorney general of the state of Maine probably spent $200,000 fighting it, and they won. And it's not so much what the laws say. The laws are all there in statute. It's whether the executive branch is going to enforce the laws and cooperate in a productive fashion. If that partnership isn't present, it doesn't matter what the laws say. And this is something that any non-governmental non group has to deal with. It takes two to tango. And I've tested that. FOMB has tested that. We've gone to the main Supreme Court now twice on asking that the basic state fishway and Clean Water Act laws um, be observed. And the Supreme Court has said that Maine's laws are called permissive authority, which means that if the commissioners want to do it, they can, but you can't force them to if they don't want to. Um, the Commissioner of Department of Marine Resources is Patrick Kelleher. The Department of in in Inland Fisheries and Wildlife is Chandler Woodcock. Mm -hmm. um, and all they need to do, say, at Corpusacani Stream, is write a one-page letter to the owner of the dam and say, under the state's fishway law, you need to work with us in putting in fish passage there we cannot get the commissioners to even write that letter. And I've been working on this now for f over six years. Who owns the dam? Uh, get a gentleman named Carter Becker from South Freeport. 
Uh, he's not using it for anything. He just doesn't want to do anything. Is that the dam that creates Pleasant Pond? No, that's the that's the third one up. That's called New Mills Dam. City of Gardner owns that one. This is the first one. It's where the Yorktown paper mill used to be. So the importance of this one is that the next dam up is a hydro dam. And it's, um, those are licensed by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And that those, those guys, those, that dam, which is a federally licensed hydro dam, is called the American Tissue Dam. If you're driving up Route 126, you can see it. Um, they're now saying that, oh, we don't have to put in a fishway here because the guy down below us isn't doing anything. So Doug's examples were dealing mostly with non-hydro dams where you could go to the commissioner and get authority to, to remove one. The federal dams are federally licensed. The hydro dams are federally licensed. But in this case, well, if, if the dam that Doug was speaking about came out, then fishway stipulations would kick in for the next right. dam. Right. Right. So the federal agency now at the second dam on Corbusy is saying, well, there's no point in us requiring a fishway here because there's no way the fish can get to it because and they're right. We've got this little dam a third of a mile downstream, and the state can require a fishway there, but they refuse to. And we can't even get them to explain why. In fact, the state has had a restoration plan for Corbusy since 2002, which states that there should be fishways at all the dams. And that plan now is 14 years old. And myself and others, Maine Rivers, Atlantic Salmon Federation, FOMB, we've simply asked the fisheries commissioners to um, enforce the fisheries plan. And their response has basically been no response. In fact, um, the last go around on this. I had to file suit in Superior Court just to get an answer from them. And the answer was no. So that was, a, that was an expensive letter. Because the Superior Court filing fee is $150. There's more than a stamp. Do, do people here have any sense of how long federal licenses are issued for? Right, right, right. No. Anyone know? So, what's that? Up to 40 years. Yeah, up to 40 years, 20 to 20, 50 years or so. Um, so all of these hydroelectric dams are licensed by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC. And uh, <clears throat> the length of time, I think, is based on the fact that back when Franklin Roosevelt was president and America was getting electrified, you know, you had to put a lot of capital in to develop a dam, build it, and you want to get a rate of return. So you ended up with these long-term license periods and we're long past that period, most dam owners have made their money several times over, making it constantly, but uh, it's very difficult to intercede in any of these federal dams to improve fish passage or get fish passage unless or until the license renewal rolls around, which isn't very often. Now sometimes the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service retains a reserve authority where they could come in and and do it after the fact. You still need to get them to do it, which gets into some of the issues that Doug was speaking about, but, but in some cases that, that reserve authority exists. Um, the other thing that I wanted to touch on, and, and sorry Doug went out, but <coughs> um, there was a, a case that went to the Maine Supreme Court uh, in the mid-80s and then on up to the U.S. Supreme Court with S.D. Warren versus the state of Maine, and it was about um, what the Clean Water Act says for fish passage. And most people historically had thought of the Clean Water Act as like you can't throw crap in the river, right? And that's what a pollutant is. And um, what came out in that case was that uh, actually a dam, dam owner, a dam is a discharger as well. Even though it's not dumping its dioxin and whatnot in, it is changing the quality of the water as it moves through the dam and comes out. And the laws basically said that the waters up above the dams had to be uh, suitable habitat, but what came out in these cases was that not only did they have to be suitable habitat, 
but that one, dams were, were polluters or were dischargers, so they were liable to the Clean Water Act, and also that the native fish had to be present, not just have the chemistry of the water be satisfactory for them. So, so that was a really historic case, and uh, it's being threatened right now on the Presumpscot River with a proposed settlement accord to remove the dam in Westbrook at the cost of several dams upstream that would uh, not come out for many, 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 many years. And so... Or not even have fish passage. Uh, yeah, no fish passage. Not even have a fish yeah it, wouldn't have, yeah, it wouldn't necessarily come out. They don't have fish passage. So we're involved in, in, in trying to do that. So what's happened is they're trading off in exchange for a removal. They're trading off the future of getting fish through Sevega Lake. So, so it's a threat to the Clean Water Act. Um, Nate. Fish passage, wake up. Um, lots of, we're talking about fish passage. <laughs> you know, is that like you knock on the door and you get to go through the dam? Or can you talk about some different kinds of passage, what we mean by that, and the issues with both upstream and downstream? Ah, very good. There are several forms of fish passage, as you are well aware. The singular best form of fish passage, uh, and none surpass it, is no fish passage, i.e. no dam. There's nothing in the way. It's an open system. Okay. As soon as there's something in the way in the form of a dam, you have to come up with something to get fish around it. This is a hypothetical discussion here. Right? So there are two principal forms of fish passage. and uh, They're referred to as volitional and non-volitional fish passage. And basically, the non-volitional fish passage is a fish lift goes up and down, it's a mechanical contraption that goes up and down, has a bucket, brings fish from down low, dumps them out up high, the fish from out, and they go on their, their way. And the reason they call it non-volitional is it, it's timed, it does its own thing, the fish doesn't get to choose. It just swims in and it goes when it goes. Versus a, a volitional fish passage, and these are typically non-mechanical, although typically mostly engineered, uh, uh, basically a trough with a series of baffles in it. Uh, there are multiple variations in this, the way these things are put together. A fixed volume of water, given that the pond height above the dam will go down through the fishway. These baffles act as energy dissipators to keep the water from going, you know, to the speed of gravity and provide some hydraulic backflow within the fishway and the fish can choose when it wants to ascend. Um, and they can either be highly engineered and appear as literally, you know, uh, very square, very rectangular um, uh, devices, troughs with these baffles. They come in multiple shapes and forms um, and every one of them however simple or however complicated they look are really extremely complicated to get them sighted well to make sure that fish can you know readily access the 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 entrance of the fishway over the widest broadest ranges of flows in the river they're really difficult to get right the first time okay and we are getting better at it you got to understand that fish passage engineering is a very very young science We've only just begun, really, in the big picture of things. We're literally only seconds into the first page of a you know, many thousands of pages long book uh, when it comes to fish passage. That's just the upstream side of it, getting the fish that wants on, on the downstream side to get to the upstream side. And we've seen a few photographs here of what happens when you're coming downstream. Because you've got to remember this is a, a dam, you know, whether, you know, typically speaking, it's whether it's a hydroelectric dam or a relic dam or a flood control dam or there are all sorts of perils associated with dropping off of high places and into maybe shallow water or maybe no water at all. Uh, and that has to be looked at as well, how you, how you, how you treat that. As soon as you have, you know, the requirement for fish passage put in, uh, you know, there's a big set of problems that you have to overcome. We are getting better at it, but it is extremely difficult and time-consuming process. And whether the hydro company pays for it or you and I pay for it, 
you will pay because they are expensive. Talk a little bit about cumulative impact. What do you do when you have lots of dams on a river? Ah. And you know you have spawning habitat, four or five dams upstream. Um, talk about escapements. Escapement. Uh, this is a very good and very serious question. Uh, this has to do uh, literally with compounding interest. Okay. You have a thousand shad show up at the base of the dam and the fish passage is 94% efficient. Okay. Now 940 of those shad make it up over that fishway. And then you come to the next dam and let's say it's 94% efficient. And I'm not going to do the math in my head because that would really hurt me right now. But that compounds, you know, and then you come to the third dam. And maybe it's not so good. Okay. And the reason that becomes terribly important and the reason I chose shad, because it is the poster child for poor passage efficiency. Okay. These fish if you could say they were collectively flighty, they see something they don't like, they split immediately. Okay? Uh, and so the, 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 the compounding effect of multiple fish passages on a main stem river, whether it be for shad or something like the Atlantic salmon, uh, can lower you to the point where you're not achieving critical mass. Where you're not achieving better than one to one Females can't replace they themselves. They can't replace themselves fast enough. So what you see is a ticking down of the population until fish passage is irrelevant because there are none left. We started at that irrelevancy already, you know, because there were none left, but we had a vestigial population in the lower Kennebec Basin. We had something to work with, which was a really beautiful thing. It's a great, great question. Steve's question was outstanding. The, I haven't seen a fish passage yet built anywhere that was 100% efficient. The oh, very obvious one is the one in Brunswick and has a viewing room and everything. How, how does that stack up relatively speaking? It doesn't work. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't work for shad. It doesn't, doesn't work, work well for shad. Um, uh, it works okay for river herring. The, 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 the factors that play into the performance of a fishway, let's say Brunswick Fishway, for example, because it's a good example. We learned Our, something this year. Yeah, we learned something this year, something very significant.